I have seen some chatter online. Overall, just 10 out of 10, honestly. I am Jackson to lack of surprise that Damon would choke Rainier. Because if they weren't gonna fight before, they sure as heck are gonna fight now. House of the Dragon, episode 10, the season finale. Did it stick the landing? Yes, it did. I have seen some chatter online. Uh, not much because I don't have time to be looking online and stuff, but what a little I have been informed of people saying that it did not stick the landing. Um, and uh, that is just objectively false. So let's talk about it. The first section um, I have is something that I had planned to talk about already uh, that I wanted to bring up as a positive as something that I quite like about the show. And then I learned that people have a problem with this and I was like, well, now I'm definitely talking about it. That is pregnancy and childbirth. I think it's great annoying that people have a problem with this. <laughs> so um, even I found myself at times watching the show inching towards the thought of like, is it is it a bit much to have this again happen? We had enough childbirth scenes and then immediately like pulling back and being like, I would never think that about a battle scene, about a fight scene. This is equally relevant to the plot, if not more so. It's just not something that gets depicted all that often. It's the exception, not the rule. And I love the fact that this show is one, giving it equal time, basically saying the bloody battle that goes on in childbed is as important, if not more important than what goes on on an actual battlefield, um, especially to the story they're telling, but in general. But add to that the fact that this story, this show, this is about essentially two mothers going to civil war with each other, setting the kingdom at war with itself. Um, so Alicent and Rhaenyra, you know, this is, these are the two at loggerheads in the story. They are both mothers and they have both had to fight to birth children and now will have to fight for their children's legacy. And I think in general, I mean, the idea that in stories we show battle, we show war, we show hand-to-hand -hand combat, we show blood, in that regard, but childbirth, if at all mentioned, is, you know, someone, some lady screaming in the other room while a father paces and we see his story, we see how he's like worried about his child being born and then some doctor saying, hey, we can't save the mother and then the, the father deciding what to do about it. But it's not often that we actually see the birthing room and seeing what the mother is going through um, or if it goes wrong. Oftentimes, again, stories will be like, everything went great, here you go, here's the baby. Or they're like, oh, she died in childbed, isn't that sad? But like, you don't see that, but you often see battles. You see men die on the battlefield, you see duels, you see beheadings, you see executions, you see, you see this all the time. So just in general, yeah, I'm glad they're, they're showing childbirth too. Cause like, yeah, that's just as relevant. But again, these are two mothers and to really bring home what they have had to do to bring forth this life, which they will now fight to fight for the legacies for, uh, for their children, you know, for Alison to fight to get Aegon on the throne, Rhaenyra to fight to get herself and then thereafter her children on the throne. It is extremely appropriate to show that. The birth that we saw in this episode was a failed one. Uh, it came prematurely and the child did not survive. Um, and it was a bloody brutal one. Um, but so then having the scene of the pyre for the dead child, I hadn't really thought of it in these terms until I heard the showrunner say that this is kind of how they thought of this scene, is that it is kind of paralleling and mirroring the scene with Viserys early on in the show when they are at the pyre for his baby that um, uh, his wife Emma dies trying to bear. When they said it, I was like, oh yeah, huh. But like, I didn't clock that at all when I was watching it. And I think the reason I didn't think of it in those terms, and I still don't really, I mean, when they said it, I was like, I mean, I guess so, but I just don't think that Viserys and Rhaenyra situations, other than the being at a pyre for your baby, are similar enough to be a parallel, or in fact, polar opposite enough to be a parallel. They're just kind of different situations, you know? So it's not, again, for, for it to parallel something or to, to juxtapose two things in that way, or for you to like mirror them in some way, usually, at least to me, that signifies that some, you're trying a parallel because these situations are in some way similar or you're drawing a parallel because these situations are in some way the polar opposite. And that's why we're connecting the two to show them as mirror images, either because of how similar or because of how different they are. And here, I mean, yes, it is a child's funeral, but that's it. Like that's the only part of it that's the same. Like where Rhaenyra is in her life and what situation she's in and what she's being forced to consider right now is so, so different from Viserys. But again, not in a way that's like the direct opposite of that, you know, like on a color wheel or whatever. Like it's not like so different because it's the opposite. It's just very different. So I just, I don't see what the point of paralleling that would be other than simply to do it, which is kind of how it seemed. I was like, when I said it was paralleling it, I was like, okay, but why? Why would you parallel that? Like just to say that she's now in her father's shoes because like what makes her be in her father's shoes isn't that she's burying a child. That is not what makes her be in her father's place right now. And even then she's not really in her father's place either because her 
uh, the legitimacy of her uh, inheritance is in question. And he hadn't like just been named the king. So anyway, I don't get the point of paralleling that. So I didn't clock that at all. But again, I liked that this episode showed that like the instant she gets this news, right, that her throne has been usurped, she goes into labor and has to spend the first hours, um, the first day of this, of this new knowledge of her father being dead and of her, the fact that she should be queen now, but isn't, that she has to spend that time with birthing uh, and birthing a child it's not going to make it at that the way that in this situation because this is what happens then people go into these like default modes including Damon and Rhaenyra has to like take extra steps to ensure that the default is not what happens moving forward because Damon by default then takes control of the armed forces and starts taking action is like okay she's gonna go birth a baby as women do I the dude am now going to you know take care of the army side of things and I don't necessarily think that Damon was trying to usurp her. I don't think it occurred to him that this is not what he should do immediately, you know? Like Damon's already kind of a take charge kind of guy um, and Rhaenyra is gonna go, gonna go birth a child. So it's just the natural thing for him to do. Again, I don't feel like he's like, oh good, she's in labor, now I can take charge. Like, I, I don't think that that's the reading of it at all. Just that this is the default. Just like that's why Aegon's been crowned. It's the default that it goes to the dude. That's what this kind of whole war and situation in question is about. And Rhaenyra going into labor at that very moment has to go even further to prevent again the default from happening. She calls her sons to her and is like, look, Viserys is dead. I should be queen now, but Aegon was crowned and I'm in charge now. I'm the queen. Your legacy is through me. Nothing goes without my say. And her sons then, she kind of um, like deputizes them to like be her voice in the room while she can't be because it is through her as she rightly says that they would have any claim anyway so it behooves them to strengthen her position in the room that she can't be in right now and again she has to work extra hard now to set everyone's mind um right to be that she's the one that's if they're fighting for her to inherit for her to be the queen then it's because she's going to be in command she's the one in charge it's for her that they are fighting not just in name but to actually rule. So I think we can segue nicely then to uh, Rhaenyra and Daemon um, and what their dynamic is like in this episode. So I want to start with Daemon crowning Rhaenyra because um, I kind of already covered Daemon's reaction to her going into labor, which was not ideal, but it was very Daemon. So anyway, the crowning scene um, here is actually where I did immediately think of a parallel to Viserys, not with the pyre. So we did learn, or at least I learned, I don't think I mentioned it in the video, but um, it was... It became known online that the scene in the episode two two preview two ago now in, in episode eight, when Viserys takes the throne for the last time to uh, reaffirm their legitimacy of Rhaenyra's sons, he the crown falls off his head as he's trying to make it up to the throne, and Damon comes up and picks up the crown and then puts it back on his head, and so this was not planned, but nonetheless, you know the what they choose to do with the footage they have what they choose to keep in and show remains, like these remain choices that they make. Whether or not that was an accident, their choice, what to do with that then moving forward is a choice. They kept this footage of Damon standing over Viserys and crowning him, where he's, Viserys is lower and Damon is higher. And this continues a trend I've talked about several times now, where the show would often frame Viserys as weaker by having the camera angled down at him and frame Damon as stronger by having the camera angled up at him. They did this even in the first episode when Viserys was on the throne and Damon was standing lower before him. The camera angles did not show uh, Viserys in as dominating a position compared to Damon as you would imagine they would, given their actual physical positions and um, political positions as well. <laughs> so anyway, we, uh, we did that yet again, right, in this throne room scene in episode eight where Damon is standing over Viserys and putting the crown on his head. Um, and they, they pan out to show that, that uh, they didn't just show Viserys getting the crown back on his head, they very clearly showed Damon standing over him. And I don't mean to suggest that in that scene they're implying that Damon holds the power in the room, but they did show that. And here, when Damon receives the crown um, from Eric and goes to Rhaenyra with it and crowns her with it, the camera does not pan out to show us Damon standing taller than Rhaenyra, because he would, he is taller than her, and he would be from a higher position lowering the crown onto her head that's just based on their sizes that's what would be going on but the camera doesn't show that it just shows Rhaenyra's head receiving the crown and then the next time you see Damon he's already kneeling so there is never a shot where he is standing over her putting the crown down on her head you just see the crown go on her head and the next time you see Damon he is below her he is kneeling before her and i really liked that they chose to do that so they've they've shown him be in charge he is obviously taller than her there's no helping that but when once she becomes queen, once she receives the crown, he is shown to be 
subservient to her. I also love that in this scene we got the return of this beautiful piece of music that I don't know what it's called in the soundtrack but I called it Rhaenyra's theme when I talked about it a few episode reviews ago. Um, I love this theme music that Ramin Jawadi wrote for Rhaenyra. They've used it several times in iconic moments for Rhaenyra throughout the show. It's this kind of like um, bass kind of drumming heavy sound with this these light feminine vocals atop. And it is, I think, a, a great piece of music for representing Rhaenyra as a character. And I love the way that they have used this music several times. And it's always been in quite sort of like epic, like very character shaping and character defining moments. They've played this music and it feels almost like planting and payoff where they've they've shown or they, they, they've shown these scenes where, again, they've been pretty important, significant moments for Rhaenyra and played this music because this is sort of like her on her way to her final form, if you will. And so in this scene, when she gets the crown and everyone is kneeling for her to hear this music again, it feels like a reprise. It feels like this is what all of those other moments were leading towards. And here she is finally. But you know, not all is well between Damon and Rhaenyra, as I already alluded to. He kind of takes charge while she's away. Again, I don't feel like he was intentionally usurping her, but that's nonetheless what he does. And I do like that they didn't immediately show him being deferential to her. His instinct is to command and to lead and take charge, always. Viserys had to deal with this side of Damon as well. And you know, Viserys is a man and his older brother. Um, this is just kind of how Damon is. So it would have been extremely out of character for Damon to immediately be like, you know, Rhaenyra is in charge. No one do anything without Rhaenyra say so. Like, that's just not who he's been this whole time. So that would just not be in character. So it felt very Damon of him to just be like, all right, I'm in charge now. <laughs> Here's what we do. And even when Rhaenyra comes back, he's still not quite willing to let go. He's like this, I know better. I'm older than you. I don't care if you're queen. And again, I don't mean to say that Damon thinks he should be king and not Rhaenyra, that he should be like the one in charge, really. But there at the same time he's like I mean you're queen and all but like I know better about this like I just do then this is just how this goes it's again it's a very like it's the default attitude when they argue he uses a comparison to Viserys as an insult to Rhaenyra you know he doesn't say oh you are your father's daughter as like oh you'll be a great queen it's like there's too much of Viserys in you and that's a bad thing which is also interesting because of how many times Viserys complained that Rhaenyra was too much like Daemon <laughs> So I guess she's at the worst of both worlds or the best of both worlds, but both Viserys and Daemon see too much of each other in Rhaenyra. And I mean, perhaps that is what would make her in other circumstances the ideal queen, that she has the more um, calm temperament that Viserys has, but has the chutzpah and willingness to do what is necessary to go to war, to do this, do that kind of thing as well. So again, in different circumstances, she might be the exact ideal queen if that is the case, that she's the perfect blending of Viserys and Daemon. Uh, then we get to Daemon choking Rhaenyra, and again, this completely checks out as something Daemon would do. I mean, for all the positivity on the internet about Daemon, he's not exactly the ideal person to choose as a mate. He's, he does awful things all the time. So I'm not at all surprised that he would choke Rhaenyra. <laughs> I'm not condoning him choking Rhaenyra, to be clear. We're talking about the writing here. And Damon, as written, as portrayed in the show, him choking Rhaenyra, I'm like, yeah, I am Jack's complete lack of surprise that Damon would choke Rhaenyra. What I love about this scene is that it, despite the fact that, that Damon physically dominates her in this scene, right, because he's taller than her and he chokes her, uh, she doesn't do anything violent against him, she still comes away from that conversation the one on top. She dominates him in terms of her power and her position because in this conversation we have this realization. Rhaenyra realizes that Daemon doesn't know about the prophecy of ice and fire and this moment not only does it give her the upper hand over Daemon in this individual circumstance, in this individual conversation between the two of them, it does give her the upper hand in this dynamic in this room, but it also gives her that final certainty that Viserys truly meant her to be his heir. And I think this is a fantastic parallel to what has been going on over yonder with Alicent, because for Alicent, the prophecy served as a final confirmation that what Viserys intended was for Aegon to take the throne. So once again, we're kind of paralleling what each of them gets from Viserys. Each of them now has this realization about that is that is prophecy related. Alicent feels that he has confirmed that he wants Aegon. And Rhaenyra realizing that she is the only one that heard this prophecy, that he didn't just maybe not tell it to Aegon, but that he didn't even tell Daemon. Daemon was his heir up until he named Rhaenyra, and he never told Daemon. And that realization for Rhaenyra about how this was not just a passing thing, this just wasn't like a well, you know, in the moment, I got no other kids, so I'll name Rhaenyra. This serves as that confirmation that he really, really meant it. But yeah, overall in this episode, I think 
I like that they showed Damon not immediately kowtowing to Rhaenyra. He takes over when she goes to give birth. Um, he takes charge. He argues with her in front of everybody. He chokes her. But I don't think that this episode at all shows him not supporting her, weirdly. <laughs> like he, in his way, in the most Damon way imaginable, he 100% supports her. And he believes he's doing everything in his power to strengthen her claim. Often that means he thinks he knows better and he's in charge and he should make the call. But he does believe that she should be queen. And he does, in his way, defer to her, at least eventually. And he does support her and her claim. Moving on then to Rhaenyra and the Valarians. So first of all, I just want to say I called it. When Daemon reacts to Rhaenys showing up with the news that, uh, you know, the, the greens crowned Aegon, I escaped on the back of my dragon, here I am. Daemon is the voice of the audience and is like, you could have ended this right then and there. You could have burned them all. Why didn't you? And Rhaenys says exactly what I said her position was when I watched that episode. This is not Rhaenys' fight. She does not have a dog in this fight. I mean, again, she does have, you know, the stake in what happens, but whether or not the kingdom goes to war over the question of succession here is not Rainey's call. It's not up to her if that happens. So when that's exactly what she says, she's like, if there's going to be war, that's not my call. That's on you. I was just getting out of there because I'm not going to side with them, but it's not up to me if we go to war over this. So as soon as she said that, I was like, Nailed it. But again, it makes sense that that would be the call she'd make. It's not the one Damon or Rhaenyra would want necessarily. It's not the one the audience would want, but it makes sense that that would be her call. Because as again, what I'm about to talk about, Rhaenys doesn't have much reason to super duper support Rhaenyra. If when push comes to shove, it's a matter of honor of um, swearing oaths of this is the side that we did swear we would support when Viserys named her as heir. This is the side on which our grandkids are. So I guess if we have a side, it's this one. But she has no love for Rhaenyra, at least at the time of her escaping on the back of her dragon. So I liked how throughout this episode, we watched Rhaenys kind of come around to the idea of Rhaenyra, not just because, okay, if I have to choose, I'm choosing this side because of the aforementioned reasons. No, that she actually comes to respect Rhaenyra as an actual person who might be the better choice as a ruler. Uh, and not just because she's not Aegon, who's like the worst choice. <laughs> That she watches, that we see Rainey's watching her and, and weighing her and measuring her. And that she is ultimately the bigger person because even, you know, the audience knows that she didn't actually kill Lainor. Rainier didn't actually kill Lainor. But as far as Rainey's knows, Rainier killed Lainor. And the fact that that is uh, something that she's able to not forgive, but set aside and still support Rhaenyra and still recognize Rhaenyra as the better choice and as a worthy choice to rule Westeros, that she has the level head to be able to say, hey, Corlys, I've been watching Rhaenyra. I mean, Corlys is for good reason, not down with that at first. He's just learned that Daemon killed Vaemond. Um, They both believe that they're responsible for Laenor's death. Corlys is like, you know, <laughs> screw all of them. Why should we side with them? And, and Rhaenys is like, look, we have to choose a side. That is clear. And Rhaenyra is trying to keep everyone in from going to war, she is showing good judgment and would make a good ruler. And also, you know, their grandkids are on that side. Um, and so I like that the episode spent time showing us Rhaenys and Corlys having to come around to this idea um, that it's not just a given that they would side with Rhaenyra, that they have to kind of come to actually choose that. And then again, to show that Rhaenyra does not take that for granted, that she did not fully rely on the fact that they would join her side for, you know, obvious reasons. So that when Corliss comes forward and is like, we're on your side, that this is not lost on Rhaenyra, what a monumental thing this is to have them on her side. And not just Corliss saying, hey, you have our fleet, but that Rhaenys herself personally is like, I'm putting my skin in this game also, me and my dragon. That that moment felt as epic as it should because they had to set aside a lot in order to make this choice. It was not made lightly and you really feel that from all sides. Moving on then to Rhaenyra and her kids. It's been pointed out um, by a lot of people that in the depiction of these characters on this show, Rhaenyra is a lot more motherly than Alicent towards her children. So we see Rhaenyra frequently um, sort of like touching their heads and their shoulders and kind of being very like physically affectionate with her kids, very touching her pregnant belly a lot. And the way that she speaks to them is usually patient and uh, coaching and teaching and comforting and consoling. That's how she's shown with her kids. Allison, by contrast, we see her slapping her kids, yelling at her kids. We see her telling Aegon that he's no son of hers. There's no like physical affection. Um, she never displays any physical affection towards them. 
when Aegon asks if she loves him in the previous episode. Um, again, I don't think she actually means to say that he actually is an imbecile. Like she's not like insulting him. Well, she is insulting him, but I don't think she means, you know, I mean, obviously she's saying you imbecile, of course I love you. But again, like what I meant, I suppose, which I, don't, I feel like people weren't clear on that or I wasn't clear on that in the previous episode when I pointed out and others have pointed this out as well, that Aegon, when he says, do you love me mom? And she says, you imbecile. No, we don't mean when we say, or when we point that out, that she is saying with that, that she does not love him. But to me, it is telling if somebody can't say the words. If someone says, do you love me? And you say, what do you think? I mean, like the fact that you can't find it in you to actually say the words, you know, you find a way to imply it rather than saying it outright, I think is telling because people struggle to say things that they don't mean. They'll find an excuse not to, or to say something similar that's not quite it. She didn't say, you imbecile, of course I love you. She just said, you imbecile. You know, it's like if someone says, do you love me? And the response is, I wouldn't be here if I didn't. You know, okay, well, why can't you just say you love them? Or use that as a supporting statement. Say, um, I do love you, I wouldn't be here if I didn't. But the, because you couldn't utter the phrase, I love you, you just skip to the, you imbecile, I wouldn't be here if I didn't kind of a response, I think is very telling, which again, when we see Aegon asking her, he's clearly at his lowest and he doesn't believe his father ever loved him. He's asking mom if she does and all she can say is you imbecile. I think it's telling. Again, Rhaenyra, when she's in labor, she calls her sons to her and tells them, you know, it's up to them because their legacy is through her. And she's sort of like forcing them to take up the mantle of their positions now, the same as she is being forced to. The show has established several times that Lucerys does not want it when he's a little kid, he says it. And then at the beginning of this episode, when he's older, he also says that he doesn't want to be the heir of Driftmark. He doesn't know what he's doing. And again, we see this as a, a parallel to Aegon, who also was like, I don't want to be king. I shouldn't be king. But Rhaenyra, unlike Alicent, she's kind to Lucerys and she doesn't say, you know, uh, shape up or ship out. She's not cruel to him. She's like, look, I'll be here to guide you. I didn't know what I was doing either. She's very affectionate. And so later on in the episode, when Lucerys and uh, Jaceres both volunteer to take up um, some piece of this mission, you know, of reaching out to their allies. Rhaenyra earlier in this episode has asked them to take up the mantle of being heirs to the queen now, because that's what she is now. That's what they are now. And seeing them now take on that duty and, and asking to actually do something um, to contribute, she then has to let go as a mother and has to accept that they are going to have to be at risk. She asked them to grow up and they are now asking to be allowed to really do so. So she has to honor that if she really does want them to grow up. And then we have the scene where she's explaining to them the mission, making them promise not to engage in violence, which is again, her her kind of de approach to this whole situation of like, we're not gonna strike first, we're not gonna be the violent ones. Uh, we will respond to that if that if it comes to that. And so, I mean, I having read Fire and Blood knew what would happen. So I was like preemptively getting devastated <laughs> watching this scene, but where Rhaenyra is then essentially telling Lucerys, like, look, like, you know, based on the conversation they had earlier in the episode, you know, like, I know you don't feel ready. I know you don't, I know this is a lot. I know this is scary. You're getting the easy job. Don't worry, we're easing you into this, which again is, it's devastating to watch when you know that he's not getting the easy job, quote unquote. Like you can understand why she would think that there's a very good reason to think that I would be the easy job. It should be the easy job. So, I mean, she's asked them to grow up and they are willing to do so. And now she's sending them out on what she thinks is like a good baby step for them. And and it's, well, it's gonna be more than that for Lucerys. A lot of growing those characters had to do all at once. Um, and yeah, it's it's hard to watch. Uh, moving then directly into Lucerys and Aemon. Much like what they've done with Alicent, which I've praised ultimately. I mean, again, I talked about the time skip, um, the initial time skip version of Alicent being a bit much to swallow all of a sudden, but in general, they've done a lot to add new ones to Alicent's character, to her motivations. She's not just a cartoonish cookie cutter Disney villain who's like, I'm here for ambition alone, rah. Like there's a lot of nuance to her character in the show, which I very, very much like. So they've done something similar here with Aemon, where again, the book tells us Aemon kills the series on Dragonback. That's all we really know. Uh, Cause as a history book would tell it, you know, that's all they would know. Like you wouldn't know what the conversation was like, what was going on between those characters. No historical record would have that information. And I like the idea that Aemond, hot-headed and angry, would pursue Lucerys, but that he would not have intended to kill him. 
And so for that to happen as a sort of like losing control of the dragon, which is already also kind of like, this is, would be a thing that Eamon would feel because it was such a big deal to him to claim a dragon and that he kind of had to go out there and get one for himself. So the idea of being able to control a dragon is a big point of like, of his ego, I guess is the best way to say it. So that he would lose control of his dragon would already bruise his ego. And then the loss of control of that dragon would result in the death of Lucerys. Well, if he goes back and tells them what happened, he either has to say, I lost control of my dragon, or I killed Lucerys on purpose. Neither is a great option. But the performances of both actors who played Lucerys and Aemond in the throne room scene um, was so well done. The tension between them, you know, you could cut it with a knife. The reveal of Aemond's eye was again to be expected if you've read the book, but um, you know, it was it was cool. It was cool to see. The performance of Aemond now after he's killed Lucerys um, of this kind of like, oh fuck, you know, I have made a huge mistake. Because he didn't, I mean, killing Lucerys in any circumstance would be, oh fuck. But given where the kingdom is right now, Aemond knows that he's basically just started the civil war. Because if they weren't going to fight before, they sure as heck are going to fight now. Which I thought was a really good choice to handle that scene that way instead of him just being like, I'm gonna kill you, and then he does, and then goes home. You know, that would have been not especially believable, especially for how these characters have been painted so far. And this just, yeah, this just makes a lot of sense that this is how this would go down. Moving next to Rhaenyra and Alicent, which is something I've talked about quite a lot now in these sections, because uh, it's crept up in all these other sections. But there's a lot of ways in which Alicent and Rhaenyra are being paralleled and being, um, mirrored and juxtaposed. Again, these two episodes in and of themselves are one is the Green Council, one is the Black Queen. You know, one is the Alicent episode, one is the Rainier episode. So like, obviously, the show is about these two ladies. But again, it was, it was a, the show did a great job in this episode showing Rhaenyra really coming to grips with this position, um, the actually like taking on the mantle of being queen now, what that means, what it means for her kids. And we similarly saw Alicent in the previous episode, like Viserys is dead and fully, com fully coming to grips with what it means if she wants to get Aegon on the throne, what it means for her position, um, and going through this roller coaster um, of change. Both of them have to go through this um, after Viserys' death. We also have an interesting paralleling of the dynamic between Alicent and Otto and the dynamic between uh, Rhaenyra and Daemon. Daemon and Otto, um, their instinct is to jump to killing, jump to war, jump to uh, violence. That's their instinct. And both Rhaenyra and Alicent show much more restraint and they check those impulses. I mean, as Alicent said um, in two episodes ago to Rhaenyra that they both have more in common than either of them would often allow. And again, Alicent tells Otto in the previous episode, an unwillingness to murder is not weakness. Rhaenyra says to Daemon in this episode, so I should go to war because I'm angry. Neither of them wants, thinks violence is the the first answer, at least. They're willing to do violence, but it's not their go-to first choice. Next, we come to the bridge scene, which is an obvious parallel. Uh, does not need me to point that out to early on in the show when Rhaenyra went without her father saying that she should to prevent bloodshed between Otto and Daemon. Here, we obviously paralleled that scene. Rhaenyra's dragon even landed on Otto's side again. So they once again had to part to let her through. Before it was Daemon that was challenging Rhaenyra's claim. Here it's Daemon defending Rhaenyra's claim. But it's still violence between Otto and Daemon that Rhaenyra is once again the person to come between and say no. No, we're not going to do violence right here today. Uh, Rhaenyra has been and continues to be the keeper of the peace which is what Rhaenys says about her to Corlys, is one of the reasons she has decided to side with and support Rhaenyra. But another thing I loved about that scene, which is nothing, not necessarily anything that happens in the scene, but it's just that the having of this scene, and because it does call to mind the much, 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 much earlier scene that happened quite early in the show with Rhaenyra, um, the young Rhaenyra coming between them, is just at this moment, we kind of go like, look at how far we've come because it makes you immediately recall this other scene. Because the whole time, you know, obviously you're aware of the young Rainier and what all has gone on, but because it calls to mind this earlier scene so vividly, and you just look at these characters and how much has happened between them and how much has happened in the interim and how much they've grown and changed and how much in general has changed since that original scene. I, I don't know, I love the way that it just kind of like brings that into sharp relief. You know, the first time we had this scene, Rainier was there on behalf of King's Landing. And now she ends the scene saying that King's Landing will have her answer. So how is this episode as a finale? I think it's a brilliant finale. I've, again, I've seen here and there these takes that it was a weak finale. Um, and I just think that that's, you know, I guess every opinion is valid, but except that one. <laughs> if you think this show is good and you don't think this finale stuck the landing, get out of here. You don't understand the show. I mean, this episode 
It closes the loop on episode nine. These episodes are a pairing. They are, you know, Green Council, Black Queen. They are a, a duo. This completes that circle. This uh, did so much paralleling for things that happened in the show in general, but also for what happened in the previous episode. It's showing us the sides. You know, we got to really know the green side in the previous episode and not just Alicent and Otto, but all the points of weakness and strength that are on that side. The breaking points, the points that uh, they, have, they, they have to their advantage. We got a deep dive into what's going on over there. And then with this episode, we got the same with the Blacks, the strengths and weaknesses of not just Rhaenyra and Daemon, but about their allies. Who's on their team? What do they have going for them? What are their points of weakness? Where might this all fracture? I also really enjoyed that it showed us not just um, Rhaenyra wondering about whether or not it's right to go to war. It also showed us the very practical concerns of going to war. Like, it's not just a question of, is it moral to do this? It's, is it practical to do this? The fact that they go through, you know, do we even have the numbers to do this? Do we have the resources to do this? It's not just, I want to reclaim my throne. You have to actually think about if that's possible. This episode, I think, beautifully completed the evolution of Rhaenyra into her final form into the Black Queen that would go to war for her crown. Because at the, even at the beginning of this episode, she wasn't quite there yet. She was very, you know, still young Rhaenyra, not quite ready to claim this position. Um, she knows she has to. She feels uncertain about these things, doesn't immediately want to go to war. The war is not necessarily the answer. But just in that last scene, we see that Lucerius isn't just the last straw in terms of, oh, in general, this side can't let that stand. Because, of course, that side can't let that stand. But what it does to Rhaenyra, to push her over the edge and to make her willing to go to war for this. Because she was not willing to go to war for the crown alone, but over the death of her son, yes. And because this this whole season has been building up to the Dance of the Dragons, um, I like that it showed us the first domino to fall, the first casualty of the Dance of the Dragons. Lucere's death is, a, I think, a brilliant way to end the first season because it shows us the real pain and the real stakes of what's about to happen. You could have ended it before that, I guess, and just that they're considering going to war, but this is what is the final kind of, this is the point of no return, so to speak. I think it's a perfect place to end it. I also liked that it did give us our very first glimpse of what we can expect a war between dragons to look like. Because up until this point, um, throughout this show and also Game of Thrones, we've only ever seen dragon versus city, dragon versus general populace, G dragon versus castle, dragon versus army. That's what we've seen. We've never seen dragon versus dragon. And the dance of the dragons is going to be many a dragon versus many a dragon. So we, we, again, we saw the first casualty of this war and our first glimpse of what this war is going to look like and how devastating it's going to be. The show overall, final thoughts about sort of all 10 episodes. It's not a perfect show. I have had complaints throughout. Um, the pacing is a little off. Again, I think they worried about losing their audience, so they were clipping along on a, at a faster rate. Ultimately, I think ending with Lucere's death was the right place to end, so if they felt they needed to get to that point, I guess. I don't necessarily think that they should have waited you know, push some of this plot into the second season, but then if we could have had more episodes in season one or longer episodes to help with the pacing. But otherwise, you know, if this is this is the goal, you know, you got to get from Viserys becoming king to Lucerys dying. If that's, you know, those are the bookends that, and we have to fill in everything in between. That being the task they are set with, they, the pacing was decent for that. The time skips, as I said before, were jarring, not just because uh, how they tie into pacing and how they are kind of jarring every time, no matter what, um, you know, I had a big problem with Alicent after the time skip, where she was just this complete 180 of a uh, character of her characterization. We didn't see like we needed. There was a point missing between point A and point C. We didn't see B. We were just kind of left to intuit that these changes had happened with her over that time skip, but didn't really see at least even the beginnings of it. Not great in my opinion. Lots of issues with Kristen Cole throughout. Not just big. I mean, we hate him. So I don't just mean like I personally have issues with the guy because of course I do, but like the fact that he murdered Joffrey the way he did and there were no consequences for this, the way that he's not really aging looks kind of strange next to everybody else who's getting either aged up, you know, like Viserys was looking like a corpse, but also the actors keep getting aged up, but like Kristen looking so young and fresh this whole time is a bit weird to me, so they could have at least, if they're not going to recast him, you know, put, give him some gray hairs. You know, there were moments of weirdness, moments of spectacle, moments of like, this is for television, which, you know, were not my favorite, but for, you know, accepting that a show is going to need to do some of that. Overall, I think most of the time it handled it decently well. Again, Kristen killing Joff uh, Joffrey at the wedding, purely so that we could have a death at a wedding. 
I didn't love it. Uh, again, I, I talked about it a lot, didn't love that, but it, you know, it's not absolutely the worst thing ever. Veyman's beheading was again a moment for television. Doesn't really work for the writing. Rhaenys coming up through the floor with the dragon. Again, I talked about it like it's, I don't think it's as bad as people said. And it, the people defending Kristen and Veyman as totally making sense in the logic of this universe, going bananas over it, not making any sense what Rhaenys did, need to pipe down. Yeah, all of it makes like equal sense, meaning not com not very good sense. Rainey's motivations did make sense to me that this is what she would choose to do, but I agree, it's a bit ridiculous that she came up through the floor with her dragon. You know, people saying then the the floor, the stones would have hit her and killed her, forget whether she'd kill the greens, you know, sure. It, it was a moment of spectacle for TV. For being that, it was certainly better than what we got in season eight. So anyone saying that we're at season eight level of writing right now, get a life. We are not. Go back and watch season eight. You've forgotten how bad it was. Laris and the feet, again, I don't know why we needed that. It was there to be weird. It was there to be a moment to make you go, ugh. Um, didn't make a ton of sense. Could have done without that. But overall, I think, as I talked about before, the task of this show is to take an outline of history from Fire and Blood and to really flesh it out, to give it the meat, to give it the nuance, to give it the character and flavor that is not in the book. It's just not that kind of book. To fill in all those blanks. And I think for the most part, it did a brilliant job filling all that in. And again, not just filling it in, because of course, they would have to write in, okay, we know this happened, so we actually have to figure out what the conversation where it was decided that would happen would look like. And and doing that alone takes creativity and, and they did a good job if and when that was what they were doing. But they also added in a lot of nuance that's not present in the book. Um, partly because the book, again, could not have that nuance because it's to do with very personal moments with characters, a lot of introspection that a history book like that just would not have access to that knowledge. So Viserys character overall, George R. R. Martin even, you know, praised it as a better Viserys than his book Viserys. There's just a lot more nuance to that character. Um, he becomes a much more tragic figure than he is in the book. Damon's character overall, I think they handled, again, a character that can very easily just be like, oh, he's the bad boy. I think they've given Damon's character a lot of nuance and a lot of it is owed to Matt Smith's great performance. Allison Turner and Rhaenyra, the get Max that they made them friends before all this goes down and the way that they've later kind of showed them dealing with the, the ramifications of their actions how to decide what to do about what's what they're contemplating doing, in particular with Allison's character because she is such an unlikable character and is positioned that way by the story. They've given her nuance, that they've given her some pretty sympathetic moments. So it's not just, oh, she's the baddie. She is much more likable than Cersei Lannister. Anyone out here saying she's worse than Cersei, get out of here, she's not. The way that they took the time to show us Rhaenys and Corlys siding with Rhaenyra. Um, I think a lot of that, again, a lot of nuance to that. Aemon killing Lucerys and showing, again, that this was accidental and how this would have gone down. I think that's brilliant. I initially was very skeptical about adding in the prophecy of ice and fire, but it, they they won me over uh, in episode eight. I was like, okay, actually, this was a good idea. You guys are handling this really well. And then furthermore, in this episode and the previous one, where the way this carries through, the way this is part of what shapes the motivations of our characters, I think was handled brilliantly and a great addition to the story. From a technical standpoint, the show has been fantastic all along. I mean, they have a lot of the same people doing it as Game of Thrones, which was also stunning. I mean, the sets, the the locations they shoot in, the costumes, the makeup, all of that chef's kiss, it looks fantastic. The use of dragons I mentioned before is always narratively purposeful. It's not just spectacle, which makes it that much more impactful when they do do it. I mean, obviously CGI is expensive, so that's part of why you'd keep it to a minimum, but they did minimally use CGI. Obviously the dragons have to be CGI and other things as well, but it didn't feel like a show that's just all filmed on a green screen. You know, it has, it has life to it. It has grounding to it. And the dragons I praised before, again, narratively purposeful, but also they feel like these weighty beasts that like, they feel alive. They feel real. They feel like they have mass again, because they did a good job, technically speaking, you know, with just like animating these dragons. Um, but there's a lot of attention to detail and how they've animated them. Have they given them personality? when and how they use them in the story. Just very, very well done. The music as always is fantastic. I love, 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 love Ramin Jawadi as a composer and he knocked it out of the park again. Yeah, he wrote some absolutely beautiful new music for this show and it was always a joy to listen to what new music he'd come up with and always added to a scene. The casting and the acting of everyone was superb. Again, what problems I had with Allison's characterization after the time skip were to do with how they are writing the character, not necessarily the actress's performance. It is also how she's directed to perform it. I think overall, everyone is fantastically cast and performing their roles brilliantly. And for a season that is essentially a prologue, I think this show did everything that it needed to do to get you hooked and set up for the following season. It showed you the what has laid the groundwork for the Civil War that is to come in a way that 
you fully understand where both sides are coming from and not just the heads of those sides, but everybody else who com like composes the mosaic of this civil war, all the individual relationships that are going to be at play when we move into a civil war. Why individuals are going to be motivated to the behave the in the ways that they're going to behave when we go into actual civil war. It gave us, again, all the information we need about all these people, reasons to root for and against people. This final episode, not just leaving off on, okay, we're about to go to civil war, but to give us our first casualty, to give us a reason to really now want to see this war because we, like Rhaenyra at the end of this episode, are like, you killed Lucerys, like this cannot stand. And to get us the audience prime, not just to be like, oh no, the kingdom's gonna go to civil war, oh no, oh. No, at the end of this episode, you're like, hell yeah, we're going to war. <laughs> All I can say really ultimately is bravo. They knocked it out of the park. For whatever issues I have, it's not a perfect show. I can't expect it to be a perfect show. For being an adaptation of a of a chunk of a small, relatively small chunk of fire and blood, it did everything it really needed to do. Certain things I would have done differently, sure. I think there's there's no such thing as a perfect adaptation or perfect show. Overall, just 10 out of 10, honestly. As a whole, brilliantly done. And I can't wait for season two. But I'm not quite done talking about House of the Dragon. Um, in a couple weeks, the week of November 7th. Um, we're going to reconvene the group earlier this year, Alex uh, from Alex Nieves and Jimmy from the Fantasy Network and myself. We did an A Song of Ice and Fire read-along um, and we also read The Night of the Seven Kingdoms and Fire and Blood. So we're going to reconvene the week of uh, November 7th. Uh, we haven't quite pinned down the date yet, otherwise I would tell you, to do a live to talk about House of the Dragon. So I'm very much looking forward to that. Jimmy's also been covering the show on his channel, so if you haven't seen his takes on the episodes, you know, go over there um, and check out what he's had to say. Overall, I think the three of us um, are mostly on the same page. Uh, in, at least I think we all agree that this show is fantastic, um, but there will be individual things that we disagree about. I already know a couple. So it should be a pretty interesting conversation and it will be live. So, you know, you can join in and let us know your thoughts as well. So for the time being, do let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times will definitely Saturdays, so like and subscribe, join my Patreon if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you when I see you.